Friends, we welcome you today. We thank you for joining us in our studies in which we are seeking to look at questions that Jesus asked people of his day and the significance of them. If they were important enough to ask then, they certainly are important enough for us to consider today. We're looking in the book of Matthew in the seventh chapter, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Is that that uh, has uh, recorded by Matthew uh, the longest uh, recording of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount? It is a masterpiece. And in the seventh chapter, as the uh, master is concluding, he speaks these things. Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. What measure you meet, it shall be measured unto you again. And why considerest thou the mote that's in thy brother's eye, and considerest not the beam that's in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, cast out first the beam that's in thine own eye, then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote that's in thy brother's eye. A mote is a small object. Uh, a beam is a large thing. In fact, uh, one translation of it emphasizes this by saying, why do you consider the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye, but doesn't consider the plank that is in your eye? When we look at the situation that Jesus is describing, he's describing the fact that here are some things that are small and minor, and yet the one that is considering those things that are small and minor and other have uh, things in his own life that are far worse than the things that he finds to fault with his brother. It is said, and well said, that people that live in glass houses shouldn't throw stone. And how true that is. There are some people that are hypercritical. They look at an individual, and as they look at that individual, they see no good that that individual does. All they can do and all they can see is the things that they take issue with. They're ones that speak evil of an individual and that have little or no good that they ever see in a brother. This is that that is sad. For the Lord teaches us that we are to not speak evil of a brother and to put away such things as this. But while we recognize that this is a present problem with the people in the world and many times with us ourselves. We should never think that Jesus is that, that is saying that there is never a time in which that proper criticism is that that is necessary and should be tendered. There is never a time that Jesus is not saying that there isn't a time, for there is always in the Scriptures a need sometimes for individuals to speak. Oftentimes, when someone seeks to offer that that is simple uh, criticism to help someone else, they say, well, you're judging. And the Bible teaches you not to judge. Well, when we look at that, the Bible teaches us that we are to judge righteous judgment. But while it is true that we are not to look and criticize a moat in the brother's eye. That does not mean that Jesus does not teach that there are things that we must seek to correct in the lives of others. Jesus teaches us that we are to be one that, yes, abstains from criticizing other brethren, but on the other hand, there is the necessity of speaking and calling attention of things that are wrong in one's life. The Bible teaches us that the Thessalonians who are urged to teach brethren to abstain from matters of malicious talk, not only did the apostle teach that, when the apostle Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, Timothy, you preach the word, you reprove, you rebuke, you exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time is going to come when men won't endure the sound doctrine. Paul tells Timothy that you reprove, you rebuke, you exhort. Reproving and rebuking are those things that are warning against things that are 
present in the world. In fact, the scripture says every scripture inspired of God is proper for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, which is in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, furnished completely unto every good work. Second Timothy, the third, third chapter. Nobody said the apostle teaches that the scriptures are profitable for doctrine, yes, but they're profitable for reproof and correction. So, Paul said to Timothy, you do reprove and you rebuke, and the scriptures are profitable for that. When the apostle Paul wrote to the Thessalonians in the second Thessalonian letter, he urged them to withdraw themselves from the brethren that walk disorderly. And in that instance, and in that context, the individual that was disorderly was a brother that would not work and that spent his time in idleness and those things that were certainly that that was not good and conducive to righteousness. Further, not only did the apostle urge the Thessalonians to withdraw from brethren that were walking disorderly, but Paul wrote to the Corinthians. In the Corinthian church, there was a situation that the brethren tolerated. They seemed to ignore. In the congregation there, a man had taken his father's wife and was one that was living with his father's wife. And Paul rebuked the Corinthian church for allowing that situation to do. And then he said, You be joined together in my spirit. Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. One would be one that would be quick to respond while you're judging if a church finds it necessary to withdraw. But the Lord teaches sometimes it is necessary and sometimes it is something that's an obligation upon man. When we look in the scriptures, we find in the Old Testament, one of the major prophets was a prophet by the name of Ezekiel. And in the 33rd chapter of the book of Ezekiel, the Lord said to Ezekiel, Son of man, I have made you a watchman under the house of Israel. And when he speaks of that, he gave an illustration of what a watchman was. First, as he speaks about the watchman, the one that was watching on the behalf of the city to see if there were those that were approaching the city with harm against that city was involved. The Lord said to the watchman, if he watches and he sees the sword coming against the city and he doesn't warn the city, well then uh, uh, those that are in it will die in their sin, but he'll be one that be blameable for he did not warn. But on the other hand, if the watchman sees the sword coming and he does watch, then he said the responsibility lies on the hand of individuals that hears his warning. If he hears his warning, does something about it, then he saves himself. But if he hears the warning but didn't do anything about it and he's killed, well, that's his fault. The one that warned is not responsible. And then as we look, the Lord made application to Ezekiel. He said, I've made you a watchman to the house of Israel. And when you see a man that's engaged in sin and you don't and warn him of his wicked way, he's going to die in his sin, but his soul I'm going to require at your hand. But when you warn the wicked of his evil way, then the Bible teaches that God said to Ezekiel, when you warn him, then if he doesn't make correction, then the fault is his, but you've saved your own soul. When you look at Paul's writing, the apostle wrote in the book of Galatians these works. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strives, jealousies, wrath, faction, divisions, parties, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I warn you, even as I did forewarn you, that they who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. These works of the flesh, which the apostle enumerates here, are not just motes, something that is a fault of an individual. It is something that is that that is soul-threatening. And by soul-threatening, I mean that if a person does them and doesn't correct them as far as his life is concerned, then that individual is going to not enter the kingdom of heaven. It's a serious enough an infraction against the law of God, that if a man dies and does not repent of that work of the flesh he's permitted, that he's committed, then uh, 
God said he won't enter the kingdom of God. Now, ones that hear the word, and they are one that are teaching the word, they must recognize that if they see a brother that is indeed practicing the work of the flesh, that he needs a warning. And I must warn him. And if I don't warn him, man, and he dies in that condition, he'll be lost. But I'll be lost too because I didn't warn him. But if I warn him, and then he does something about it, good. He saved his soul. But if he doesn't do anything about it, he's going to do one that's going to be lost. But I will have a cleansed my hands. I will not be guilty of the blood of that man. Of course, always, when we seek to correct someone, it must be done with the spirit of meekness and humility. Paul wrote to the Galatian brethren in the, the sixth chapter and said, Brethren, even if a man be overtaken in a trespass, ye who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, looking to thyself, lest thou also be tempted. The Lord didn't say, if you see him, uh, just leave him alone. Don't look at the moat in his eye. No, the Lord said, if... Uh, a brother be overtaken in a trespass. Spiritual men are to restore him. They have an obligation to do so. They must warn him. Yes, we must be careful that we're not hypocritical. We must not speak evil of brethren. We must watch and guard ourselves against murmuring and complaining and finding fault when little fault is to be found. But we must also remember, on the other hand, there are those things that will cause my soul to be damned. And the individual that comes to me kindly and warns me about it is not moat hunting. And he doesn't have it, my hurt in mind. He has my well-being and welfare in mind. I should appreciate a person that loves me enough to point out something that will keep me from heaven if I continue practicing it. And you should too. Thank you for listening. May God bless you, and may this day be full of God's richest blessings for you.